Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our Old Testament lesson. I read again Micah 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Micah was a prophet in the country of Judah. He worked around 700 years before the birth of Jesus. This makes him a contemporary of prophets like Isaiah and Amos. Our text today is well known among Christians because it is the one that tells us that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. At the time of Micah, the glory days of the Jews were past. The once mighty days of King David and Solomon, when Israel was actually a world power, were long gone. The kingdom had gone through a civil war, dividing into North, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. From a military, economic, and political perspective, the northern kingdom of Israel was certainly the more powerful of these two successor kingdoms. However, from a spiritual perspective, it certainly was the more bankrupt of the two. The kings consistently led the people away from the true God. Their spiritual poverty eventually led to the fall and elimination of Israel. Assyria became a world power and they attacked and destroyed Israel, deporting those, deporting those citizens and dispersing them around the empire where they adapted and assimilated into the pagan culture. These are the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel. Assyria repopulated the land with pagans. Assyria then marched south, attacking Judah, planning to do exactly the same thing, but the Lord delivered little Judah. This all happened about a hundred years before Micah. Assyria itself fell to Babylon, Babylon also waged war against Judah. It was a long and protracted affair, but eventually, in 586, Jerusalem fell and the Jews were deported. This all happened about 100 years after Micah. The key difference between the Jews of Judah and the Israelites of the northern kingdom is that the Jews didn't assimilate. That is, they never adopted the pagan religions. They did, you know, buy homes, plant gardens, and that sort of stuff. But they never adopted the pagan faith. When Babylon itself was defeated by the Persians, the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland. They rebuilt the temple, and though they never became a major political and military power, they continued to hang around until they were finally destroyed by the Romans after the birth of the Christian church. So to put this all in another way, Judah at the time of Micah might be what we would call a third world nation. Their glory days were behind them and they would never come back. They were small, weak, and rather unimportant. It is from this weak and apparently inconsequential nation that God will bring forth the Messiah. Our reading emphasizes this. First, of course, you simply have the historical reality. They were a second-rate nation. Judah wasn't making anybody shake in their boots. Then in verse 3, we are told that the Lord had given up the Jews. This little phrase tells them that they will not rise again. But as always, in the, 
at least with God, hope is also present. But the hope comes in an unlikely way. As I said, they're not going to become a military power again. They're not going to become an economic power, but they are going to be a spiritual powerhouse. The promise of the Messiah, first issued to Adam and Eve with the promise of the seed, is reconfirmed. Micah added that the birth of the Messiah would be in Bethlehem. If Judah was a backwater nation, Bethlehem was a backwater town in that backwater country. It would be something like selecting Magnolia, Delaware to be the birthplace of the most important person of all time. Who here knows where Magnolia, Delaware is? A couple of people too. Okay, I'm impressed. You know your geography. That town has less than 300 people. And about as many people here know where Magnolia is that would have known where Bethlehem was in the days of Jesus. In fact, my brother, he had to look up Delaware when I moved here. <laughs> so he would know where I was. Now the good thing is, of course, the map has Delaware. And it even has Newark. But I doubt seriously that it has Magnolia on it. That was little Bethlehem in Micah's day. And to be honest, it hadn't changed a whole lot in the days of Jesus. This represents a clear pattern in God's action with humanity. St. Paul caught it very well when he wrote, But the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And there is nothing new about this thought. Micah's contemporary, Isaiah, wrote, He gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. In America, like most people throughout history, we love things that are bigger, brighter, more obviously powerful, first the winners and the like. Who remembers the losers of the Super Bowl, the losers of the World Series, the losers in the Olympics? We all remember Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong taking that first step on the moon, don't we? Who was in Apollo 12 who also walked on the moon? We all remember Christopher Columbus, the admiral of the, the seas, he was dubbed, and his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, right? But who remembers the captains of those three ships? We like first, not second, third, fourth. Because of the human nature of noticing the big and the flashy and first, it is not surprising that the mighty, the mightiest works of God, so often go overlooked. God's great deeds come in small packages. So while we might marvel that God created the heavens and the earth, the more amazing thing that he did, in fact, the greatest thing that he did, was the incarnation of Jesus. Yet it was unobserved by humanity, except for Mary and Joseph, two poor people, two unimportant people. The shepherds paid no attention until an angel told them about it. The shepherds, though, also weren't really important people. They were part of the lower class, even though their jobs were actually vital for the economy. They were blue-collar workers who had to work on the Sabbath and so seldom, if ever, got to go to the Sabbath worship services. There Overlooked in a feeding trough lay the miracle of all time. God and human join in a supernatural way, in a miraculous way. It is a union that still exists to this day and always will. 
He who Micah described as the one whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days, lay in the lap of Mary and drank her milk in order to stay alive. Here Micah tells us of both the beginning of the Son by the Father in eternity and the beginning of Jesus in time. The greatest gift of all time came in this very small package. This way of God's acting is a mark of His great mercy. As a general rule, the powerful in human history have demonstrated their power by imposing their will on others. If you offend the powerful, you pay the price. In ancient times, if a general lost a battle, well, he might also lose his life for that failure on the battlefield. Shoot, even a messenger who brought such bad news might be executed for bringing the bad news. That's where we get that don't shoot the messenger saying from. If you are an actor or an actress and you offend the powers that be, you might discover that all the promising roles you were once getting have vanished and there are no offers coming your way. If you work in the steel mills and you offend the leaders of your labor union, you might find that you have no real protection, no benefits, and the like. If you are a Republican or Democrat politician and you don't toe the party line, you may well pay the price when re-election time rolls around and the party endorses somebody else. Shoot, I remember one person who worked in a fast food restaurant, so it's not a, you know, what you would consider a big, lofty, powerful position. This is a fast food restaurant, and the manager told him that he, the manager, was the god of this restaurant, and this employee had better do what his god told him to do. To this young man's credit, he quit the job. But that is what human power is like. You impose your will on someone else. But what if God acted like this? Adam and Eve would have never lived to see their first child born. They would have been eliminated by God. Maybe God would have started over again. Maybe not. The mercy of God is where God chooses to manifest his greatest power. Or let us think of the exodus. People tremble and accuse God of being cruel when you, they think of those ten plagues and the drowning of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. They fail to hear all the warnings that God delivered through Moses. Not one of those plagues came unannounced. And all of them could have been avoided if they had just let the people go. But no. They fail to realize that the pillar uh, that uh, separated the Egyptians from the Hebrews actually was protecting the Egyptians as well because it kept them from going into the Red Sea. But when God removes that pillar, do the people learn did they hear the warnings of God? No. All they could think of was getting another chance to oppress their property, the Hebrews. God's mercy was ignored. Mercy is, after all, for the weak, or so many people believe to this very day. But the most powerful being in the entire universe is merciful. God comes in the flesh. God comes as an infant. God comes and grows up in a blue-collar home. God comes and teaches as an itinerant preacher. God comes and suffers injustice at the hands of the powerful. God comes and dies a criminal's death, though he had never done anything wrong. God comes and is buried in a borrowed tomb. God comes and the world overlooked him. God came in a small package. 
go, but through this life, but through this life that was overlooked by the great people of his day, Jesus was accomplishing for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. He took our sins upon himself and paid for them on the cross. He redeemed all humanity. That is what Micah is referring to when he said, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. The rest of his brothers are the Gentiles. Through his life, death, and resurrection, he has opened the way for Gentiles to become part of Israel. Indeed, all who believe in Jesus compose the true Israel. They are the children of the promise, that is, the children who have believed in the promise of the Messiah. In a very real way, this is also a small package. The gift God gives through Jesus isn't powerful in the eyes of the world. It isn't going to make anyone a millionaire. It isn't going to turn anyone into the next Einstein. It isn't going to make the most beautiful person in the world fall in love with you. It isn't going to make anyone a mighty general. It's not even going to make you an NFL star. In so many ways, from a worldly point of view, faith is useless. But faith in the Son of God is the most wondrous gift of all time. Through this weak and overlooked gift, God grants us forgiveness, peace that passes human understanding, and life eternal. At this time of year, all the Christmas movies seem to want to tell us what Christmas is about. Well, this gift is what Christmas is all about. And amazingly, it is about how God loves you so much that he sends this little gift laying in a manger for you. This gift is still overlooked by the humanly powerful and wise. But for you and me, we recognize it for what it is, the greatest gift of all time, God's little gift for you. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>